I'm Jeremy Holm, and this is Jesse Brooks, and we uh, together designed this program. It's a pilot program. It's the first year, so I really appreciate each of you being here uh, for what we're going to do. The heroin and opiate crisis in this community, in Vermont and in Mount Abe, is a huge challenge, and the answer to the challenge lies in you, in your creativity, in your vision, in your thoughts, and in the steps that we're going to take together to get the word out about it, because information is power. These uh, are little workbooks for you, and I'm just going to give you a little brief rundown of the, uh, the eight-week course. The first week, we're going to have these fine gentlemen who are coming in on their own time to volunteer their personal stories about dealing with heroin and the heroin uh, addiction and opiate cycle, right? Um, the second week, we're going to have a gentleman come in and talk about storyboarding, scripting your ideas for the public service uh, announcements that you're going to make. Then the next three weeks, we'll have experts come in to talk more about how heroin affects the brain, medical professionals who've pronounced people dead, who've uh, shot people up with Narcan to save their lives. Um, and then we're going to have people who uh, have kicked heroin come in and talk to you all. Okay. It's a pretty heavy subject, and I admire the courage that each of you have in just, in just being here today. Um, hopefully we'll have some fun along the way. You're going to learn a little bit about um, film production, about video editing, about storytelling. But more than anything else, I hope that you'll bring the best version of you to each of these sessions so that you can find that voice, that artist, that thinker, that storyteller that can help our community, right? Because that's the only way that we're going to stop someone from reaching into that pill bottle, from waiting to meet that person to buy that bag of heroin, from sticking that needle into their arm, from ending up at the morgue because they got addicted to heroin. It's all about science. It's all about human nature. It's all about the fact that once you put this drug into your body, it takes away your choices. It changes your brain permanently and there's no way out once you get in. So what I want to do is just let these gentlemen speak, tell you their personal stories. We'll save a little time at the end um, to ask questions of them and of me. Um, Jesse has a few things to say about the United Way of Addison County and, and what we're going to do. And then uh, I have some equipment to hand out to you guys. And then uh, I'm going to want you guys to divide yourselves up into teams. You need to pick a production company, a film production company name for your team by next week so that we can set up drop boxes for you to upload your, your um, whatever footage you guys start to get. And uh, so I have not met these fine gentlemen. I, I met their, uh, one of their colleagues. So I don't know much ab about you gentlemen. Uh, Matt Daly, and I'm sorry, Mr. Flansburg. Brad Flansburg. Brad Flansburg. So, um, without further ado, gents, obviously these are state troopers in Vermont, people you shouldn't be afraid of, people you can look to to help you out when you're in a jam. So, gents, yeah. please. Guys, my name's Matt Daly. Um, I mean, kind of a brief history, we'll, I think we'll just go through a brief history. I was born in Vermont, I was born in Rutland, so I know about heroin and all that stuff, just from being down there. Um, graduated from Rutland High School. Went to college, coached football for two years, kind of figured out I didn't want to do that. And then, uh, you know, my, my dad was like, the state police are hiring, so kind of threw my name in there. From there, got hired back in 2005. Started out in the Shaftesbury Barracks, and transferred up to St. Albans, did a small stint in traffic safety, and I was in the drug task force for about three and a half years, and then I came to New Haven um, where I'm at now, and, um, just doing the road stuff, like we stop cars, we go to overdoses, you know, all the medical, most of the medical calls and stuff like that, 
traffic stops that we'll get into as far as people bringing heroin and, and that sort of thing up. Um, Guys, I'm Brett Flansburg. Um, I work out of the New Haven office as well. Uh, originally from around Albany, New York area, uh, so I know very well about the heroin issue coming from there. Um, graduated from a small high school, kind of like this. Went to college for two years, played college sports. Uh, graduated and went, got straight into the state police, tested and got in. Um, so what I am is I'm a drug recognition expert. So I'm trained to recognize impairment in people that are on the influence of drugs um, and driving. So sergeant stops a car and suspects that somebody's on the influence of drugs or narcotic heroin. Um, what he'll do is he'll arrest him for the DUI, call me and I'll come in and I'll do an evaluation where we take blood pressure, pulse, stuff like that, check their eyes, and then determine whether or not they're under the influence of a drug. Um, so I just recently went through that training maybe like a year ago. Year ago in January? Yeah. Year ago in January, so I've been doing that for about a year, seen a lot of stuff. Um, and I still work the road. I still go to overdoses, still do all that stuff, uh, respond to calls. Can so, you talk a little bit about that? Like, that, what can you tell us about the last overdose last call overdose? you were on? Like, um, how recently was? We we go to them probably, probably, maybe like, me personally, probably like two to three, maybe a month. Yeah, they're, there. they're a good amount of calls. I mean, so not quite once a week. No, not quite once a week, but that's just me. So well, that depends, doesn't mean so, right. Like, yep. You know, Virgen has their own police department, so if they'll get called. We won't. We won't go to that one. Or Middlebury gets called. We won't go to that one unless they need. Um, but I mean, we also with the with Narcan being so available now yep. to people. Um, sometimes when they get together and someone overdoses, they use Narcan on each other. So we don't end up getting called for the overdose. It doesn't mean the overdoses aren't. Can you happening. talk a little bit about what Narcan is and how yep. it works? So Narcan, we are we have, we carry Narcan now because all first responders in the state of Vermont are supposed to carry Narcan. What it is is when someone overdoses, uh, it reverses the effects of an overdose for opiates. So any kind of opiates, oxycodone, oxycodone pills, heroin, anything like that. Someone overdoses, and you know that's what they're on. You give them Narcan, and what it does is it it will bring them back to usually. Um, Sometimes it takes two or three times because the level, the amount of opiates that they've used, uh, it should take one time, but because people shoot up so much, trying to chase that first high, they overdose and it takes, I've seen it take four um, to bring someone back. So essentially what we do in overdose calls is we show up, someone's not breathing, they're not responding, they're, or they're very shallow breaths, um, and we will, if we have it readily available to us, um, we'll give them Narcan, and if they don't come to um, rescue, we'll come in and give them Narcan as well, and hopefully they come back to it. Usually they, they do with Narcan. Um, sometimes sometimes they don't, and rescue has to do their own thing with them. But It's not, it's not like they come, when we say come back, it's not, yeah, they're, not like they're, they're, they're not like coming back and being like, oh, man, thanks a lot, that was, that was great. Yep. They, they're very upset, they're mad, they're, out of it still because you've basically taken away that high. Like they're like seriously upset. They're sick, right? Yeah. Yep. And I mean, if you talk to people who have used heroin and stuff like that, when they get dope sick, they're like it's the worst feeling ever. You know, and a lot of it started back in well, when I was on the road in St. Albans. I arrested this person for um Oxycontin, oxycodone, those were the big kind of opiates back then, and no one was using heroin. So we're riding back to the barracks, and I'm like, well, okay, you have an Oxy 80 that you can buy for 100 bucks, and you have a bag of heroin that you can buy for 30 bucks. I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you spend $100 on this pill when you can buy a bag of heroin? If you're going to do this, they're essentially the same thing, right? They're all, they're all opiates. And they're like, well, I know an oxy 80 it's prescribed it's you know it from a pharmaceutical company they know what they're going to get bag of heroin you have no idea what you're getting it's you know it, it's a little powder in i mean obviously hopefully you guys haven't seen a bag of heroin but a bag of heroin that is barely anything there and you have no way of knowing what's in it and and things of that nature and that and that's kind of why it's Right now, it's so dangerous. Like we've had to redo the way we 
handle drugs because typically what you would do is you'd come in, you'd, you'd open up the bag, you'd be wearing gloves, and you take a small amount in, you put it in a test kit, and you shake it up, turns a color, and you know it's heroin. Presumptive test. So you send it to the lab after that. But now, with the introduction of fentanyl, it a little bit of fentanyl gets in the air, stuff like that, and like we, we could overdose. So we don't even guys on the road if they get bags of heroin, they put them in the bag and they ship them to the lab. So it, it's gone from the the pills. Pills went away, they regulated it. They used to be able to crush up the pills and they used to be able to snort them. They reformulated the pills, they couldn't crush it. Well, they could still crush them, but they would be inactive. So that's where we've kind of gone into this heroin. So it's essentially the same thing. People were doing this way back, you know, I say way back when, you know, 10 years ago, but it was pills. Now it's shifted into heroin and heroin's coming in. And now it, it's kind of a progression. Like it was just heroin at that point and now it's heroin and fentanyl. And pretty soon it's gonna be going into something else. So it's, you know, we've kind of, I kind of got off track with doing the, doing the no, Narcan and stuff, too, but it's, it's just, it's, you are not in a good spot. We had, one more story, there was a kid we arrested for, he was bringing up, I don't know, four or five hundred Oxy 80s. Every time he went down to New York City, he had a connection down there. He'd bring them up. So we arrested him. This kid did, he was at like, 10 pills a day. So he had to do 10 pills a day just to function. So that's a thousand, almost a thousand dollars a day. A thousand bucks. He wasn't even the worst. There was a guy who was doing like 20, 24 pills a day. Um, but they, it's, it's not like they were after the high at that point. It was just to be able to wake up. He'd have to crush a pill and snort it just to kind of get up and just to function like you guys are now. Like that's the kind of thing. And so we arrested him, he was in the, in the cell, he didn't have any pills, like literally defecated all over the place, peed his pants, started to throw up. Like, and you talk to these people about what they're going through and it's the worst pain they've ever felt in their life. They're like, my hair hurts, that they're just awake. They're like they will literally crawl up in a ball, in a corner, and they don't care if they you know, they go to the bathroom in their pants. They're just hurting that bad. So that's the kind of downfall that, that you see. And that's why you have all these other crimes that are being committed is because eventually that money's going to run out or eventually they're going to stop going to their job. Eventually they're going to have to do something else to supplement that income so they can go and purchase their heroin or pills or whatever it is. So that's why it's just kind of this broad reaching thing where it's not just, oh, these are drug dealers and these are drug addicts. It's affecting everybody because your guy's house is, no one's home during the day. Hey, knock on the door, no one's there. We break into your house, try to find something that we can go to the local pawn shop and, and, and take out. So that's you know, kind of a broad spectrum of, of how this whole thing affects everybody. But it, it's just, it's an awful way to go through life. It really is. And, I mean, if that's what you guys are doing with these, with these, um, the videos, I mean, that's something I think that maybe you, you should really get a, get a handle on and, and show it to them because a lot of, a lot of people are like, oh, cool, man, like, just hanging out, do a little bit of heroin here and there and just for fun, see what it's like. And the problem is, it's not, it, you know, alcohol and weed are the same kind of thing, right? Like. You can get addicted to it and stuff like that, but heroin, you know, the the first time you do heroin is probably not the last time you do heroin. One in three. The, yeah. The so amount you almost of, can't not right. do it. It's kinda of, it's kinda of like meth, right? We don't like to talk about it because it's not super prevalent, but it's here. But people are doing meth. Like you do it once and you're pretty much done. One in three people are addicted to heroin the first time they try it. Are completely addicted and can't stop. One in three. It doesn't mean those other two people aren't addicted because they're going to do it again because they feel like they're not addicted and they're going to do it again and then they're going to be hooked. But one in three are instantly addicted as soon as they try heroin. So as soon as not, they... Not by choice, it's not by choice. scientific, right? It's scientific, yep. It is, you are addicted. Your body craves that dopamine level that 
um, if that the heroin produces it produces a euphoric feeling because it your body's receptors releases dopamine and your body already releases dopamine on its own and what happens is you shoot the heroin and it releases more dopamine and you get that euphoric feeling well now when you don't have the heroin your body is craving those dopamine levels because you're not getting that those dopamine levels so it is literally it is a disease addiction is a brain disease and you are now addicted because your body's craving those dopamine levels that you're not getting so that's why people go through withdrawals people Literally, they'll cramp up, they'll crawl up in a circle, or crawl up in a ball in the fetal position in our cells, and they'll cry and cry, and they have cramps, and like he said, they'll say their hair hurts, and certain things, and they're sweating, and they're pale. I mean, like, white. It's, it is, it's not a pretty sight. It's really not. Can, can I ask you guys, you know, when you arrest somebody, and you find heroin in their car, and, or maybe you've, you know, you, you shoot some up with an Narcan, you bring them back, or maybe you don't, you get off at the end of the day and then you drive home. How, how do you deal with that? Like, what is that like for you guys as, as human beings doing a job? It's hard. Um, it's hard because you see that it hits home. I, I, I live in this county, and especially when you go to your own town and you're dealing with these types of things, or you stop a car and you get hair out of a car that's coming through your town, or you get someone overdosing who lives just down the road from you. And it hits home knowing it's out there and that we can't do everything. We can't get every little amount and no matter how hard we try. We can't do it. And we can do what we can as in stopping cars and getting heroin out when we can, but we don't know every single car that's coming through. We can't just pick one out and say, eh, it's got We don't know that. So we know it's coming through our towns and we, it, it, it's hard to deal with that when you go home knowing that your neighbor just overdosed or someone else did that has kids and you know quick story we had somebody overdose that had a 10 year old kid 10 year old kid got in the car and drove down the road because he didn't have cell service at the house to call in that his father was overdosing i mean that's that's sad and that that really hit home to me that a 10 year old had to get in the car drive down the road to get cell phone service on his father's cell phone to say hey my father is overdosing and the fact that he's 10 years old and knows that his father is overdosing on a drug that's what hits home to me that's that's hard. That's really hard to deal with when you go home and say, what's that kid's life gonna be like dealing with that? How to deal with that? Because it's not gonna stop. And especially when we go and you talk to the father, and the father claims that after he was given Narcan and claims that I wasn't overdosing, I'm like, no, 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 he's lying, I wasn't overdosing. And then proceeds to yell at the kid for driving down the road. Kid saved dad's life. Kid saved dad's life. And he's That's yelling at him because Essentially, he's upset that he's not high. He's upset that he doesn't have that high that he was chasing because he feels like he was overdosing, but he feels like that's as high as he's going to get. So when he got Narcan, he felt like that ruined his high, and he was literally upset with his child, his 10-year-old child, because he claimed he ruined his high. And that's what, literally five miles down the road? Yeah. Like, it's not like it's a call like somewhere else. Like, that's, it was yeah. down five years ago. You know, and it... That's where it, that's where it's hard because, you know, none of you presumably have children. But, you know, when I was in the drug unit, we were doing a we were, we had an informant. We were doing we were going to buy drugs with this informant. Um, so we set up. We're doing surveillance. Drug dealer comes. She's got her two kids in the back of the car. Our informant gets in the car. She's like, listen, I need your money. I gotta go get it. Her kids are in a car. She, she doesn't know this guy. Like, she met this guy maybe once or twice, right? She literally was like, all right, listen. She turns to her kids, stop yelling. He's gonna watch it for five minutes. She gets out of the car, gets in her own, or gets in another vehicle, drives down the road. But she, like, literally left her kids with this complete stranger. She had no idea. Obviously we were there, we weren't gonna let anything bad happen to the kids, but it, it's just insane. Like you would never in a million years, like, it, you know, put it in perspective for you guys, it's like, you have brothers and sisters, like, or if they're younger brothers and sisters, you would never leave them with a stranger. You know what I mean? It, it's just, it boggles your mind, but they're so focused on getting high and getting the heroin that they can't, they don't think straight. They, if you, told them probably 10 years prior that you were gonna get in a car and leave your kids with some complete stranger to go get high, 
they would be like, no way. But they're doing it. Do you find the majority of the drug dealers that you arrest are addicts? Yeah. So people aren't dealers just to make the money. They're uh, dealers uh, because it, they're so addicts? There's a, I think there's a difference. That you're finding that people who are not from around here that are coming up from the city, they, they're, they're not addicted. They don't do it. They, they refuse to do it because they've seen what it does to them. So what they'll, what they'll do is they'll have, for lack of a better term, a junkie. Like they bring them down to the city with them and they'll be like, hey, listen, try this heroin. And they're, they're like, yeah, free heroin? No problem. So they try it. They're like, tell the drug dealer, like, yeah, it's good dope. So they'll pick up a bunch. They'll come back up here, and, and then they'll sell it. So it, they're not stupid. Just, just, just yeah. to have them test the batch for them. Yes, so they don't have to do it because they know that they're going to get addicted, and they don't want to be. You know, They're looking at this is a huge moneymaker, and that's, what the, that, that's their sole motivation. So your local dealer is probably addicted, but uh, uh, they are, or they are supplementing it. their addiction through selling. So they're, what they're doing is they're getting enough heroin so I can sell you 10 bags, you 10 bags, you 10 bags, and you 10 bags, and I can do the other 10 bags for free. And then I collect all your money and I do it again. And then I start to need more, so I need to bump up my level. So that's what they're doing is that they're, not, they're not doing it to make money. They're not making money because the way they live is absolutely wretched. They, there's... The houses are disgusting, and it's just not clean. What the do the kids, houses look like? They, there's food. Like, I've literally walked into a house, and, the, and they have animals. They have dogs, right? And, and they're letting the dogs go to the bathroom on the floor, and they just walk over, and they scoop the food. Food in the yep. sink with maggots in the yeah, holes. It's, they don't care. The trash they piled up everywhere. All they care it about smells so bad. The hive. That's it. No. Um, has anybody, did anybody read recently about the traffic stop in Virginia? It was all over the news. We read that. Um, those guys, we, they did, they talked to them and stuff. Those guys aren't users. They, none of them use. They are bringing it up from the city and bringing it up to Burlington. Um, and all that stuff that was taken out of there, I mean, I've got it all right here. Um, all from just the press release, just 27 grams of powder cocaine and 100 bags of heroin. That's one traffic stop coming through. Any weapons in Virginia. the car? Um, I don't know. I don't believe there was. No, I, not that I heard. And that was Friday, right? That was Friday. Yep. Um, Friday. Yep. Right. And that's this one, isn't. That's this one, isn't distant. Uh, this is happening. It's probably hap There's probably heroin being sold right now in Mount Ebb somewhere, and that's where you guys come in. You guys, we got to talk about it. We got to talk about it with our peers. We got to talk about it with our aunts, our uncles, our parents, because if we talk about it, people are going to know yeah. not to reach for that that oxycodone that they were prescribed. Throw it away when you're done. Tell your dentist, guess what? I, you know what? I'll take an Advil. I'll be okay. It'll throb a little bit, but I'm a tough guy. I'll get through it, right? These little choices that we can make, that we can teach our friends, our neighbors, and our parents to make, can help stop this problem. And that's what this whole program is about. Talking about it, getting the word out there. These guys are volunteering today. They're not getting paid right now. They're doing it because they know you can help. And that's the whole reason that, um, I, 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 want, I just want to interrupt real quick. I was driving, I'm a professional actor, so I'm, I'm, and I'm not usually in this area, but I was doing a gig and I was driving from Stowe to, to Virgenz, and uh, I was listening to NPR, and they interviewed the police chief of the town in Ohio who posted the pictures on Facebook of the two dozed out people in the front seat of a car just idling at a stoplight with a toddler in back. And the interviewer said, why did you post these on Facebook? These are people. He said, because I need help. I can't arrest my way out of the problem, right? I can't put all these people in jail. There's not enough jails. And, the, and I don't have a treatment program. The waiting list is 120 people deep to get someone treatment. So at the end of the program, the interviewer said, well, if you had all the money in the world, unlimited budget, what would you do? He said, education. So that's, that's why you're here. You're here to help us educate this community about heroin. You guys probably already know a lot of this, right? Some of it you might not know. So I want you to really listen 
to, to what these guys are saying and, and take notes of the things about it that are surprising or interesting to you. So when you begin to storyboard this, your scripts, and you begin to think about what you want to film, what you want to shoot, you already have this stuff boiling in your head as artists. Sorry to No, I, was, I, I, was, I just want to go on one point that you made, is a lot of it, how people get into the spot, they don't go out and they're not like, I want to get high tonight, I'm going to go pick up a bag of hammers. They are athletes, they are working at home, they slip, they fall, they, they hurt their leg. They get prescribed um, oxycodone, they get s s uh, prescribed morphine. It, it boggles my mind and we've tried to go the doctor route and say, listen, why are you giving these people 100 pills for a month? And they're like, oh, well, they can't drive here, they, can't, they don't have access to it, so we, we give them a large amount. It is okay to be in pain a little bit. Like, it is okay, and, and that's something that I think you guys should hit on, is like, it's okay for your leg to hurt. You broke your leg, it's okay. Take five Advil, put some ice on it, raise it above your head, it's, it really is. It's not gonna kill you, but you, the problem is is that people don't have a plan to get off this stuff. So they use, up. they're like, oh, this is, I feel good, they, right? Like you take the pill and you feel better and you don't think about you like. Take more than they should. And, they, and then they get, and that's how, that's the majority of how people get addicted. And that's how they end up. Because they fall off a ladder, they hurt their back, they're out of work. Eventually the doctor's gonna cut you off. But you are screwed because you have not weaned yourself off of um, the, the narcotic that you were prescribed, that's legal, but you don't have a plan. So if it's having people come up with plans or having the doctors being like, all right, I'm gonna prescribe you, you know, 10 morphines, but here's our plan to get you off. Like, you come back in a week, we'll reevaluate you, and then we cut that down. Something like that. So that might be something to touch on is like, it's okay to hurt too. Like. You know, I. He just wrote a great tagline: "Pain won't kill you, but heroin will." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just so I want to, credit. Just to reiterate, <laughs> the education portion of this, um, what they both said is, I was asked once what I thought the solution to the heroin epidemic is, and my answer was education. You guys, because you guys, this generation, you guys can get the word out. You guys, you guys will know if someone's using a narcotic, using heroin, and you guys can help save them someday, because. You guys can educate them, you guys can tell people, I think they're in trouble, I think they're using heroin, I think they're using a narcotic, and you can save someone's life down the road. And educating doctors as well in medical school, I think, is a big issue. I think instead of saying, hey, here's 100 Oxycontin, um, because it's easier to fill out a prescription rather than have them do therapeutic treatment. Instead of that, like go to, go to physical training, go to certain things instead of saying, here's the pills. So it's an education, educating you guys, so you guys can educate others, um, and educating doctors through medical school. I think is going to be a is going to be part of the solution to this. But you guys are the biggest part because you guys can save someone's life that's going to this school. And if you, you guys, guys make those, somebody you know, you guys make those videos like, you know, like Show he them. said, like pretty graphic. Like that's why, I, if I go to the doctor and I like hurt myself, I'll be like, yeah, I'm taking that. Just give me yep. an ibuprofen, because I'm not like. Right? Like, I'm not, I, I could be susceptible to that thing. Like, I've had addicts in my family before. Like, it, it's in the back of my mind. I've gotten so many of these things that it's like, I'm not even coming close. I got kids at home. I'm not going to do that. I went to like, they, like, I literally take a bunch of ibuprofen. My stomach will probably hurt, right? Because I think, you know, because my leg is, is throbbing. But hey, you limp around for a few days. It gets a little better. You take less ibuprofen and. Before you know it, you're back on your, back on your feet. You I know went what to I mean? the dentist the other day, and I'm still young. I have to get my wisdom teeth taken out, right? So they said, the, before they even knew who I was, what I did, anything, the dentist said, oh, so we're going to have your wisdom teeth taken out. And he said, but don't worry, we're going to prescribe you some really good narcotics, and you'll, you won't feel anything. Do, do you know if I'm, a, if I'm a user, if I was addicted once to narcotics or anything like that? He had no idea. But that's the way it is. Oh, here, we'll just get you some. And that should be their first question. Yep. We're going to prescribe you some narcotics and, and you won't feel a thing. I don't even want that. I told him no. In the chair, I said, 
I said, you can take my teeth out all you want. I don't care how much pain I'm in, but I'm not taking narcotics. I said, I don't even want the prescription. I said, don't even give it to me. Well, I'll give it to you just in case you need them. I said, I don't want it. I'll go home and I'll take ibuprofen, I'll take Advil, and I'll sit there in pain before I take these things because I've seen what it does to people. I've seen the families ruined by these types of things. I, I will not take, I, I will not take a narcotic. I just, I think that it, yes, it's useful in the medical world, all that stuff, but I personally will not take it because I've seen what it does to families. I've seen it tear apart families. And, and don't get us wrong, guys. If you if you're in the hospital and the doctor's like, yes. you need to take this. We're not we're not bashing narcotics altogether. Like if the doctor's like, you just cut off your leg, you probably need a morphine or something like that. So <laughs> yes. don't get us wrong. Is that we're like, no, you can never take these things. But like, when you go home, you better have a plan to, or your family member better have a plan to get off on. Jesse. Yep. So I just want to piggyback on what they're saying um, to sort of give you guys a broad overview. A lot of what these gentlemen do and a lot of what's asked and now sort of quote unquote required of medical and law is above and beyond what their actual job descriptions are. They're dealing with mental health issues, not just criminal issues. And that really is above and beyond what their duties are. Um, same with medical. This addiction has kind of bled its way into medical as well, and that's sort of what they're talking about, that medical now, because this happened so fast and it spiraled so fast, that they're now realizing, oh, hey, I actually should say, do we even want this? Um, coming out of one of, I, I have two kids, and coming out of, um, coming out of my delivery, going home, um, because of some complications, they offered me pain medication. Well, I'm gonna be nursing a child. I don't want to give my child pain <laughs> medication. So, but they didn't. They didn't ask me. It wasn't a conversation. They just handed me a prescription. So um, that's some of the things that they're talking about in the medical field. Of hey, just ha take two minutes to have a conversation and just ask them. Do they want it? Um, the other piece of it is uh, because there are so many different medicines out there. An antibiotic versus a painkiller people are getting their wires crossed. So an antibiotic, they're encouraging you, and, and there's all this information out there to, to take the entire thing. Don't stop because you feel better. A lot of people are confusing that with pain medication. So they'll get a full bottle of pain meds, and they will truly think that they have to take the entire bottle like they would an antibiotic. So there's also misinformation out there that um, is getting miscommunicated between the patient and the medical provider. So there's what sort of what they're saying is it's just multi-layered and that's again reiterating what Jeremy's saying what they're saying this is where you guys are so pivotal pivotal and vital to this epidemic is the more that you guys know the more you're aware is the more you can take control in those situations when you're in the doctor's office you could say um, I didn't actually ask for this how much do I really need it and, and, and sort of questioning them because they have a million things to do um, and, and also recognizing the amount of work that these gentlemen truly do um, is, is also super important. Um, and I just want to piggyback a little bit there. The pharmaceutical companies are also to blame in this because what they'll do is uh, the oxy-80. It's discovered that people are crushing it and snorting it. And then the state of Vermont makes laws about how many can be prescribed. So then what the pharmaceutical companies do is they tell their scientists, hey, we want you to reformulate this. We want the same effects, but we're going to call it something else. We're going to call it, what's your name? Sam. We're going to call it Sam 80. It's a new pill. It's not been tested. Um, the FDA is going to approve it, but there's no proof that it's addictive. So we can run this for two years before anyone knows it's addictive, and people are out there using it again. Then, then it's discovered that Sam 80, sorry, buddy, it's addictive, and the legislature passes a new law. Guess what the pharmaceutical companies do? They reformulate and they do it again. And this is a this is a, a fact. It's happening right now and it keeps happening. So you when you're doing when you're becoming your own experts about heroin, which is my wish for you, that 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 you are as educated as I am about heroin, um, that you pick your own, you each pick your own interest of it. Like what is interesting to you? Is it is it like I thought of something um, when you were talking, Matt. Um, like it's a guy saying, saying, you know, ah, I hurt my leg, ah, and he just, he's like, 
I'm a tough guy, I just need ice. And he, and he puts ice on his foot instead of the oxycodone, whatever it is. You can pick anything you want as long as shooting this, as long as it's safe and as long as it's legal. I don't care what you shoot for the PSA. We'll teach you how to do it, we'll teach you how to shoot it, we'll teach you how to edit it. But the idea is the creativity is yours. And I'd love it if each of you, each of your teams, because we're going to ask you to split up into whatever teams you want, pick your own, whatever is interesting to you about the epidemic, right? Whatever part of it th that you think people don't know about and that would reach out to your peers, your friends, your family, right? Sorry to interrupt. I just, just wanted to, to get that up. We're going to be dealing with pain. Has anybody here play sports? sports? Yeah. Anybody ever sprained their ankle? Right? So, did you get prescribed narcotics because of a sprained ankle or did you just deal with it? No, I just dealt with it. Okay, some people say that a sprained ankle is worse than a break. So, why are we prescribing narcotics for a break, broken leg, broken leg, broken foot? When a sprain is worse, you're not getting prescribed narcotics for a sprain, you're just dealing with it, right? If you can deal with a sprain, you can deal with a break. Right? So, I mean, to me, that doesn't make sense. Some people say sprain's worse than a broken ankle. So, if you can deal with a sprained ankle, you can deal with a broken ankle. I just didn't get a part in a movie with Alec Baldwin, and the, the story of the movie is it's a lacrosse coach from Long Island whose son gets injured. He's a star player. It's a true story. He, his son gets injured, and when he goes away to college, and he starts popping the pain pills, and the kid ended up ODing on the Long Island Expressway on heroin. It's a true story, and this coach's son died, and they're now making a movie, which I didn't get the part, but um, <laughs> the, part you going for? Uh, the assistant coach, <laughs> assistant coach, so I play against Alec Baldwin. But the point is, these stories are out there, but we've got to keep telling them, and we've got to tell it in this community. Sorry. I, I do have, um, after the sergeant is done, I do have a video that I would like to show you guys, if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's great for, you guys are doing the PSAs, and this is a great video, and maybe it'll give you guys some ideas. Um, and, yeah. I, to be honest with you, when he was like, oh, I got a video of that, I'm like, yeah, no. But they actually do a really good job in, you know, what we're talking about. How, how long is it? Five minutes? Okay, great. Okay. I just want to leave. I need some time at the end. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We had a, I don't want to mess up. Oh, you did? Yeah, it's hooked up. I just got a chance. So has anybody in here heard of the mannequin challenges going around? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Has anybody seen this video? Right. The hair and mannequin challenge, worst outcome? Yeah. Yep. Well, this is actually, they did a really good job, and it's actually what it's like for us to respond to an overdose. Um, does anybody know exactly what an overdose is? What it is is when overdosing on heroin, it depresses your system completely. And people don't know they're overdosing. So shallow breathing, stuff like that, it gets so shallow that you, your chest, the weight of your chest suffocates you because you can't, because you, you can't breathe. So that's what an overdose is, you suffocate to death. Okay. This is a great video. Oh, I did see this. You did see it? Yeah. This is based on true events, but these are actors. So.
pretty good representation of like what a house will look like too. Is, yep. You know, it doesn't have to be a trailer, obviously, but it's definitely. Was that based on an actual? Yep. So that video goes on to have the family actually talk um, in a graveyard um, over their brother's grave, and they're talking about the heroin epidemic and how people need to be educated, and that's how we're going to stop it. Education. So it's a great video, and if you guys are going to be doing um, you know, the PSAs, that's definitely a good video for you guys to you know, maybe do something like that. Because that really, to me, at least that hits home to me because I go to these things, and that's almost exactly what we see when we go. Was that road. fentanyl that killed all those people? That so time? that was heroin mixed with fentanyl. Right. Yep. right. So um, just to kind of go off the, the fentanyl thing, like we were talking about before, heroin, people cut it with fentanyl. And that is like a hundred times more potent than heroin. So you can touch it and it absorbs into your skin. That's why we can't test heroin anymore. And just a quick, quick story. We have a guy that overdoses quite frequently. And um, we, when we deal with him, last time we dealt with him, I gave him Narcan twice and Rescue gave him Narcan twice. And he wasn't, he wasn't coming back from his high. He wasn't, we couldn't figure out what was wrong. Well, it turns out he's having an allergic reaction to fentanyl that was in the heroin. And I asked him after, I said, did you know you're allergic to fentanyl? And he said, absolutely. I said, well, you know they're cutting heroin and fentanyl. And he said, yeah, he said, I don't care. He said, because I need to get high. So he doesn't care. He doesn't care that he's giving himself an allergic reaction and he's gonna die of an allergic reaction. He just wants to get high. And that's how badly he's addicted, how badly he wants to get high. And that to me, that hit, that hit me hard that he doesn't care about it. He has kids too. He doesn't care about leaving his kids. I'm sure he does, but he needs to get that high and he doesn't care about having an allergic reaction. He just, he takes a chance every single time. Guys, do you, as, we, as we're talking here, do any of you have any questions uh, to, to ask our troopers here while, while we have them with us? Could be anything. You could even ask him how to get out of a traffic ticket. <laughs> Although I personally haven't found a way yet. <laughs> we can leave our, I mean, we can leave our uh, emails too. So, like, you guys are doing this, you know, I mean, you That'd be great. presumably have questions, not right now, but further down the road. And then you guys can bounce us an email and we'll... That, and if you guys are going to do videos and you need law enforcement officers for your videos and stuff like that, I'm sure we can help. The range that Fred does well on camera. I do, yeah. So. That is unbelievably uh, generous. Yeah. So, uh, so we don't mind volunteering and helping you guys out because, again, you guys are going to be. Part you guys of help us out. You, know, you guys are going to be part of the front line for this. So, so. You, you mentioned that Narcan is, is readily available to first responders. Obviously, you people, is it? Yeah. Is it available? Because typically, to now, yep, now you can go like yeah, school nurse. Nurse. You go to CBS. Yep. You go to CBS and buy it. Really? Get it CBS. Yeah. yeah, it's cheaper than. So. Put it this way. And how is it administered? Yeah. Through the, through the nose. Nasal. The nose spray. Yeah. So put it this way. In Vermont, the heroin epidemic is so bad that Narcan is cheaper than an EpiPen for someone who's having an allergic reaction mm -hmm. because that's how bad it is. So someone with allergic reaction pays, what, $500 for an EpiPen? That's what they need because they need it to live. And someone... Because of that dirt bag on Wall Street. Yep, someone on Narcan. <laughs> someone, uh, bucks before you can Narcan walk. is like, I don't know, 23 bucks. Buy a store. And you know, you walk into a house and you're like, no one has Narcan lying around. Like, you guys don't go home and they're like, hey, mom, can you move your Narcan? Because I got to put the, you know. You know like, it, it doesn't happen. It, yeah. it's, it's insane. But you go into these houses and there's Narcan everywhere and you're like, when's the last time you did heroin? I don't do heroin. Okay. Yeah, we found a, we found a stolen car out of the Bronx once in a garage. Yeah. And walk right into the garage and there's Narcan in a trash can. And I'm like, oh. So then I go up to the people and I go, how long have you been using for? I don't use. Yeah. Yeah, you do. How long have you been using for? I don't use. Why do you say that? Because like, there's Narcan in your garbage can. No one just carries Narcan around. So how long have you been using? Well, I've been using this and doing this. Like, but they're the best liars ever. Yep. I swear to God, anybody who uses opiate, greatest liar you'll ever meet in life. And they will switch. Like, you could be like, there's a $100 bill. And they will look at it and they'll be like, no, it's not. I swear to God, they're the best liars ever. You interview them after. They get busted. They will lie to no end. Yep. And you can call them out on it, and you can point the truth right at them, and they will still lie to you. I mean, and, they, and they'll maybe give you a little bit of the truth, but then 90% of it's a lie. Like I said, at traffic stops, I'm a drug recognition expert. That's what I'm trained to do, is train to recognize impairment. And there's only one drug in this world that constricts your pupils. And I mean, I'm talking constricts your pupils. It makes them pinpoint, and that's a narcotic. 
And when I go up to a car and I see those pinpoint pupils and I ask them, well, how many, when did you use narcotics? Or, I didn't use narcotics. They did, when did you use narcotics? I didn't use narcotics. And I tell them what I do and what I'm trained to do and that that's the only thing that does, that's the only drug that will do that to your pupils. You're lying. I didn't use narcotic, I didn't use heroin. Okay, what are the track marks on your arm? Did you use heroin? No, I didn't use heroin. <laughs> okay, well, you know, it's, it, they will continue to lie and they will not, they will not admit the fact that they used or that they are using it. It, is it because of stigmatism or scared of arrest? Why, why, I, why do you think that is? I think it's both, and I think some people just also don't want to admit it. They know they have an issue. Some, some people know they have an issue, and they're, they try to deal with it in their own way, or they, they're trying to get help, and they can't. Like, it, like I said, like the Suboxone program, I know so many people that are trying to get on the Suboxone program, which is to help wean you off of an addiction, heroin addiction, and they can't get on it because it's such a long waiting list in this state, and we just had a we just had a drug rehab facility close. You know, we had one closed, so that's even more beds, and that's even more people that aren't going to be getting the treatment that they need. And there are people out there that want the help. There are, and there are people that don't want the help that just don't care, that are just addicted and said, I don't care, I just want to keep using. But the people that need help now are having a hard time finding a place to go. So, but the crisis is so so bad in this state that all over pretty much in New England. Um, That's the kind of thing too is not to interrupt but like you get on Suboxone right like they you meant to get off of heroin like you don't want to live your whole life taking a pill Suboxone like there should be some way or some if you're going to be in the Suboxone program which you can't get in the Suboxone program unless you're doing heroin or you're addicted or you have it in your system so like if Brett tries to quit on his own he can't get in the program because he's not addicted right now. But, and just giving you guys ideas, but like, there's got to be some way, it's like, you don't want to keep on taking a pill for the rest of your life. Your liver is going to be, you're going to be dead in, you know, 10 years. Keep on doing that. It filters through your liver, right? Like, there's got to be some end where you're like, you want to get off heroin? Great. We have this tool to help you. But you want to get off that. You don't want to be taking anything. Like that's that's the thing is like focus on stuff like that is is taking a violent narcotic to get off narcotics. Right. Is, it's it's insane. Yeah, it is. And then people are saying I can't live without my suboxone now. So if I don't have my suboxone, I'm gonna go through withdrawals. So what's the what's the point? What's it doing? Uh, it, to me, it's doing nothing. To me, it's you're just helping an addict. Well, it, it, it's, it's training one addiction for another. It, pretty much, it is. It helps. It is help. It's supposed but to be they, helping you off. And, and give these people credit. Like they do want to get off the drugs. Like no one wants to be addicted to it. Like you fight through all the stuff where they're they're not doing anything. They're not doing this. They they do want to get off it. It's not like they're they're not bad people. They didn't start out this way. Like oh, I'm just gonna you know start stealing all my family's checkbooks and writing checks to myself and. They know they're going to get caught, but they can't stop. And they're not, they're not bad people. They're making horrible choices, and they can't, they, there's no end in sight. So there's got to be some way where you got to filter these people to an end point. They, they can't continue this. You can't do heroin and then do Suboxone for the rest of your life. You, and they got to be filtered through somehow. So I just had somebody steal somebody's credit card and went around to all ATM machines and taking money out of the accounts. And I went to the guy and I said, you know, you're on there's video cameras. You know your face is right in the video camera. I don't care. I needed, I needed to get high and I don't care. I don't care what the consequences are. So you don't care that you're getting arrested now or you're, going, you're getting taken away from your kids and you're going to jail. I don't care. I, I just want to get high. Okay. They, they don't care. They don't care about the consequences and that's what addiction is. They can't. No, nope. they can't care. So. I need to wrap up this portion just because we have some business to take care of. Last chance, any questions today? Question for you. Yes. Why are you so in, why, what is your connection to heroin? Um, my, um, my wife and I were, were friends with Philip Seymour Hoffman. We used to vacation with, with he and his family and he died of a heroin overdose. And, uh, we recently moved up here from, from New York and um, you know I, I heard that it was a huge problem and that program I heard on NPR pissed me off. It made me really angry. And so, and I know from, from being an actor and working with, with young folks that that's, 
that's where the talent and that's where the skill and that's where the power is. So I devised this program with Jesse to, to help to stop the problem. Because, and I'm going to be unpopular with Jesse and maybe even these guys for saying this, the only way to really stop heroin is to stop it before it starts. Because my view is once that needle is in your arm, even if you do get treatment, your life's never going to be the same. It's done. That's my stark view of it. Yes, there are treatment programs. Yes, some people make it out. I've never read any statistics on how many people make it out. How many? I, I'm going to say it's less than one tenth of one percent. Once the needle's in the arm. And it's and you guys just remember too, because you guys are in the front lines. It's not just a needle as well. It's also the fastest way to get high is also smoking is in suffering a drug. So um, just remember that too. People smoke heroin. That's the fastest way to get high. People snore heroin. People do all that stuff. So you see somebody who when you're at a party and it looks like someone's smoking something odd, you know. You never know, okay? They, it's other ways of using heroin other than just injecting it. So just because you don't see any needle doesn't mean someone's not using it. Okay. Cool. I think the other thing to keep in mind, guys, and sort of one of the things that we're trying to promote within this program is that this, this type of situation, this epidemic, have you guys heard the term it takes a village? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what this is really for. So even though Jeremy's not a a trained drug expert and and even though I'm you know I have I have I manage a prevention grant and sadly it the prevention grant um, does not include heroin which is interesting to me but that being said not um, yet it doesn't but maybe <laughs> next year it will. We, we ruffled some feathers with this program which in a, in a good way um, so the point is is even though you might not think or know that you are connected or that you, you know, don't necessarily have a family member or um, whatever it may be. It's in your community, and and for lack of a better word, it should that should piss you off. At, at the very very core, that should make you mad. It's it it that because it could happen to your family members. It could happen to your friend. It could happen to your best friend. Um, you could be late to a game one night because these gentlemen have stopped um, and are doing a drug bust and it will affect your life. So uh, d determining what scale it is, whether it's making you late for a really awesome game that you want to be a part of or a prom or whatever it may be, or you're going home and you find that your parents have just overdosed, it's going to affect you. And so that's the idea of this program is that it, you don't have to be an expert. You just have to be aware of it. Right. And you just you just have to want to make it a better place. So that's that's you know one of the reasons Jeremy is here is he's he's also a dad, but he's also just a guy with a really big heart. So. Well, I want to I want to thank you guys for. <laughs> Stay safe out there, and, and I appreciate your willingness to help us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And I've got your emails. So yeah. I'll you yeah. Guys so, guys, don't be afraid to email us too. Yeah. This, this questionnaire is for after we're done. But I'd like just to huddle up everybody. If you could just gather up over here real quick. So I want to talk to you guys. So, what we need to do by next week is I need you guys to figure out, you know, what teams you want to be on and how you want to divide yourselves up. You could all be on one team. And we didn't announce this generally, but there is a cash prize for the winning team, and then there are, there are cash prizes for the two other teams. That uh, You're Rebecca. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. We were late. I'm so sorry. It just dawned on me. I'm so sorry. Um, so there will two, to be two um, uh, runner-up cash prizes. The winning one's getting on TV, OK? I'm working my connections to make it regional and maybe even <laughs> bigger than that, but we know it's going to be on local TV. Um, how many, then the other question, how many of you have iPhones? 
Okay. So good. So we have a good amount. Do you have Macintosh uh, in the school? Do you have apples in the school? No. At the career center. We have at the career center. At the Hanover Center. Yeah. Right. Okay. So and they have. I've talked to them. They will welcome you anytime if you want to go over there and edit stuff. Okay. Just run that through me or Jesse. We can make that happen. And they have brand new. They have like twenty brand new machines. I can even talk to them. They have some machines upstairs they're not using. I can maybe see if I can get one of those over here for you. If you want to do just one team, great. Next week we're going to have drop boxes set up so you can upload your stuff onto Dropbox that way you don't lose anything. I'll also have a community folder of footage that I'm going to upload there, stuff that these folks are helping us out with. Anything you want to share, we can do. I also have this, which I'm just going to give to you now. If, if you're shooting something on your iPhone and you want to use one of these, it just makes things a little steadier. It's a very simple device, just clips on like that. All right. This is a more sophisticated one, and you can do lots of different things with it. You can get a skateboard and turn it into a dolly to do panning shots. I'll have lights for you hopefully next week. Um, so this is another, and the, the, obviously the iPhone fits right in there. You're going to be editing all of this in iMovie. Pretty simple program. If you don't know it, um, you can even get, uh, most people have iMovie on there. You have a new phone I saw, right? Yeah. Most phones have iMovie on the phone, right? So that's what we're going to be editing in. It's pretty simple. Um, I'm going to have a guy named Tim Joy come in, and he's going to talk to you guys about how to edit in iMovie. Um, and he actually, we didn't show it today, but it's in your packet. Um, is it in your packet? might be in your packet. He, he designed, uh, he wrote a PSA and filmed it last year. He's a professional filmmaker. He lives in Middlebury. So he's going to be here to teach you that portion. Next week, a gentleman named Keith is going to be here. He's going to talk to you about storyboarding your ideas and writing a script. I'll say this. These, these PSAs are either 15 or 30 seconds, your choice. They're not long. Simple is better. So I want you guys to start looking at commercials on TV, right, and PSA. Start thinking about it right now, because eight weeks is going to fly by. Now the truth is we have a little more time than that, because you, I'm going to give you guys a little time after the last session to finish these PSAs, but it's going to fly by. So start thinking about it now. Start shooting something now. It can be as simple as you know a ball rolling down a hill, whatever it is. Start thinking about it. and. And don't say no to anything. Brainstorm with each other, come up with an idea, and, and pretty quickly, like within three weeks, you're gonna need to solidify your storyboard and your script so that you can start to shoot it. The shooting of it is gonna have to happen on your own time, on weekends, whenever. We won't have time to do it during the sessions, okay? So, and I'll, Jesse and I will work with you to help to, to support that. And I wanna introduce Rebecca who I'm just meeting, we've talked on the phone. Rebecca is a uh, new resident of our community from New Jersey, has great experience working in the arts and working with, with folks your age, and she's gonna be kind of a, a mentor for you guys to help you out, help solve problems. Even if she doesn't know how to solve the problem, we'll find a way um, so you can filter those things through Rebecca, okay? You wanna say anything about yourself? Um. You know, you, so I'm, I'm new to the area. I feel the same way Jeremy and Jesse and everybody does about this epidemic. Um, and I um, am a director and worked, ran a performing arts high school um, before I moved up here and just want to use my background and skills um, in, uh, in a meaningful way. And this is a very meaningful way. So, And, I, and what, what you guys are now. Now, now, what you guys are <laughs> is you're artists now, right? You're artists. And you're going to someday look back on, on, on this week and say, you know what? That was a cool week because that's when I realized all these things are possible. Because more than, you know, the heroin education that we're doing, I want you guys to pick up some skills and some interests that maybe you can use in your life that have nothing to do with heroin. You know, think about commercials, how they're shot, how they tell a story. Think about editing. Like, what is that world like? Who works in that world? Is that world interesting to me? I just want to give you another experience 
to put in your tool bag of experiences to take with you as you pretty soon start thinking about college and, and vocational schools, whatever is next for you, right? Um, so if you guys could do the questionnaires, and um, they're anonymous. Um, they're just, as part of the United Way, we have to collect so we can track information. I'm the boring part of this um, And then if you have any questions at any time, um, you can get in touch with Jessie. You'll have her email. The packets kind of explain the whole pro program. There's a notes section in here. And I'll be quiet and give you a few minutes.